Good morning. <laughs> How's everybody today? Are you blessed and highly favored? Are you highly flavored? Are you the salt or pepper? <laughs> oh man, I need a Bible. <laughs> In fact, I need a notebook. Oh, glory. I need glasses, too. <laughs> oh, yes. God is good all the time. Oh, nothing greater than getting in God's presence, you know? There should no, it's just illegal to be straight. You should be drunk all the time. There should be no straight Christian. They're the dangerous ones. It's the drunk ones in the spirit that are, you hoo Let's grow for it. You know, there's no fear in a drunk person. But in the world, a drunk person's afraid of a, getting busted. See, in the kingdom, you ain't got to be afraid of none of that. You can decide. In fact, the, the drink of the Spirit is on the house. <laughs> it's free. Jesus paid for it. I have a full tab. An eternal tab. <laughs> Woo, glory. First Peter chapter 1, please. But you got to press in. You got to lose yourself. And you got to fall in love. <laughs> and he must be your fulfillment. <laughs> you know, I feel sorry for people that don't know Jesus is their fulfillment. And they are missing out so much. That's what religiosity is. It's all tradition, letter, knowledge, and all of that stuff. It's, but it's really not the area where a person presses over and across. And, and where Jesus is there with open arms and, and hugs you and grabs you, and the exchange is made. See, in that place, in that presence, in that touch, in that change, there isn't anything that can compare to it. Nothing. Nothing can compare. I, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what you've done. Where It's got nothing to do with you. It's everything to, do, everything to do with him. And when you cross over to that place and him exchanges in you, there's a great exchange. It's phenomenal. That's what we thirst and hunger for every day. That's what we strive for every day to get more and more closer to him. The, there's a song that says to know you is to never worry about your life. <laughs> Amen? To never worry about your life. See, when you know him, you protect his presence in your life. That means that you avoid things. You don't want to grieve the Spirit because you want to protect God's presence in your life. You know, one of the things the Lord was sharing with me this morning, in the area to where holy, the word holy, you know, to live a, have a holy life, have a holy conduct. To, it, it means to be holy is to be sanctified unto Him, to be His. In other words, you're not anybody else's but His. He, you're his, first of all. And so we share Christ, and he shares us. Amen? So in this sanctification, there should be a life of sanctification if you really want to know him. Or else there's a distance. See, religion has long-distance relationships, or even a distance relationship. This is not about knowledge. This is not about intellect. It's about relationship, 
personal spirit to spirit relationship. That's where he wants us. And that's where he's bringing. Things are happening right now in the world in hope to draw mankind more closer to him. Things are being exposed. Our character and conduct is being tested. In fact, right now, we are, our sanctification is being tested. It's being tested right now. There's a process of testing of sanctification, whether we're living a sanctified life or not. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, Let's speak it together. Therefore, gird up the loins of your what? Your mind, your thoughts. In other words, make sure that there's a guard over them. Be what? Sober. And rest your hope fully, fully on the plan of God or the grace of God that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is what? Holy. You also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now can you be holy without being sanctified? No. So sanctification is holiness. And if you call on the Father who is without partiality, judges according to each one's works, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your life, or your stay here in what? Fear, that means reverence, honor, and respect. See, some people still have not learned that yet. They've not learned the respect of God. They've not learned how to respect his presence. They haven't learned it yet. And there is a process of learning that. And that it comes by relationship. To be taught something is different than to experience something. When you experience something, there's a change. People can go to school and learn all kinds of things. And until they experience it is when it becomes true or not true. It's when it becomes a part of our life. So many of us in our earlier youth have heard about Christianity. They've heard about going to church, many of us have. Many of us have heard all things of different religions, but never really, and even tried to practice some of them, but never experienced the source of them. Because when you truly experience the source of where it's coming from, it's going to bear good fruit or bad fruit. It's going to bring deception and bondage or it's going to bring freedom. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is freedom, nothing else Nothing. In verse 18, he said, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but your aimless, from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before, before the foundation of the world but was manifested in these last times for me and you. Who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope is not in man but in God. Again, holy is a word known as sanctified. We are sanctified unto God, separated for him for the purpose of expressing and serving his character. Amen? Amen. It's a life of sanctification. It's not a moment of sanctification. See, so many times people think that they got to get sanctified to get something done. No, you should live a life of sanctification and you'll get a lot done. Amen? In Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 1. Ephesians 2 verse 1. Life of sanctification or a life of holiness. Let's speak it together. 
And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once ac walked according to the course of this world, to the prince of the power of the air, to the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. In other words, we are under God's wrath until rescued. It was just a matter of time. His wrath hasn't been released yet, but it will. But his judgment is being released. An increase of his judgment is being released now. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. In other words, by his plan you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together, together. I want to say together. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Can you walk in them without sanctification? No, no. Once sanctified, we were once sanctified through the worldly ways under the control of the unseen demonic forces of evil and able to see the regimes of uh, governmental corruption of the forces of evil. We now were rescued and stripped away into a divine lifestyle guided by the divine sanctifier of our soul known as the Holy Spirit because holy means what? Sanctified. So you've got to come to the understanding now that the Holy Spirit is your sanctifier. He's the one that is always trying to get you sanctified. He's always trying to bring you into a place of divine position. He's always trying to strip you from the ways of the world of thoughts, of attitude, of motive, of desires. All of these things of lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life, of religiosity, of self-righteousness, all of these things he's trying to constantly, of pride and arrogance, all of these things that are associated and attached to the world, he's trying to always separate us and sanctify us. Why? So the character of Christ can be expressed through us. That we may live a lifestyle sanctified to God with freedom. It's not a religious thing. See, because in that, there's, not, there's no burden. When the exchange has been made and you find that exchanges continue. Heck, I was a drug addict, drug addict and in the drug world for over 20-something years. I cried out to be free. I didn't know what freedom was. I didn't even know if it was available. I knew, I knew that there was a difference between normal and abnormal. At that time, I was abnormal. But when I got saved, I realized that the normal are abnormal. Because they're still attached to the world just because they don't use drugs, drink, or whatever. If they're promoting and voting for the things that are displeasing to God and living a lifestyle unsanctified, then they're abnormal. And we're normal. Has everybody got it? There's a difference. So there is a process of these things. Amen? There's a process. We're going to go through it. And look, and you're going to learn by your suffering. Because we love to suffer. I didn't get too many smiles on that one. 1 Corinthians 1. See, you think it's abnormal to love suffering. It's supposed to be normal. <laughs> Verse 26, please. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. A life of holiness is a life of sanctification. 
Let's speak it together. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Who's called? The abnormal. Hello? <laughs> but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing to the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. In other words, we couldn't do this on our own. We've tried and failed. I, mean, I wanted to stop using drugs and whatever many times, even stop for a short period of time. Just went to something else. But I wasn't fighting flesh and blood. Those are spirits, demonic forces. So you can put them under management for a little while, but then eventually they want a full course meal and you ain't going to sit there. They take possession. Hallelujah. We are in Christ's righteousness. Amen. Look at this. It says, there's no flesh of glory. Verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. And now we have righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord and not in his flesh. So again, we are in Christ's righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that the glory goes to the Lord all the time. Who has granted us a holy lifestyle sanctified in the spirit. We are sanctified in the spirit. That's why the word says sons of God are led by the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit is the holy sanctifier. So the sons of God must be sanctified, separated unto God, His. And it says, with the Spirit of the Lord, there's freedom. So by living a sanctified life, you know, you can't do this in your own strength. You are going to cooperate with the Holy Spirit who's the sanctifier of your soul. Remember, your soul is in the process of conversion. That your mind, your will, your emotions, your imaginations, your conscience, subconscious, your attitude, motive, your desire. All of these are associated with your soul, which needs to be converted. It needs to be sanctified unto God. So there's an exchange made where everything is associated with Christ's character. See, your spirit, man, should have dominion over your soul and your body. Your spirit, man. And when your soul acts up, you know, hey. Get in order. Your flesh should never have an opportunity to act up. It's always under control by your spirit. When you're in the spirit, that means your spirit has control. If you're not in the spirit, your flesh has control. Or your soul has control. See, there's so much where people don't realize. I was, um, you see things posted, especially on flesh book and stuff like that. Most of the stuff that's on Fleshbook is the most emotional aggressiveness. It's an emotional aggressiveness. It, see, it should be a, a, a righteous aggressiveness, a holy aggressiveness. People live an emotional aggressive life instead of a holy life and a sanctified. And this is where God's trying to bring us to. He's trying, that's why every, right now the body of Christ is under the test of sanctification. The whole body. Why? Because he must sanctify, it is always, what happens, sanctification always follows judgment. I mean, it goes before the judgment. There's sanctification, then judgment. Sanctification and judgment. Why? Because those that are out of place, hopefully they'll get back into place. That means things, the judgment in the body of Christ is not the judgment according to the world's way. Judgment in the body of Christ is chastening, lack. It's an area where prayers are not answered. It's an area where God is distant from an individual. That's judgments to the body. Where God causes stumbling blocks. And hope that a person comes out of arrogance, pride, religiosity, or deception to an area of humility and submission. 
See, all of these areas, he, he's exposing what we're trying to build as our will instead of his will. Our plan instead of his plan. When a person is under the judgment of God, it's not the wrath of God. It means that whatever he's doing is being judged. There's a judgment constant there. And in that, it's recorded. And in that, there'll be an area of chastening, rebuke, or reward, depending on what the circumstance is. So right now, the body of Christ is under judgment in the area for sanctification. We, our sanctification is being judged by God. Is everybody okay? Romans 12. Now, so many times people think that sanctification is by how you dress. Now, there is, a, uh, there is an area to that, you know. I mean, it doesn't mean you dress like a pimp or a hooker. Amen? But you dress sanctified unto God. And there's an area where, you know, you just don't expose yourself and whatever and, you know. In certain, okay, so if you go swimming, you can't help that, you know, but there's that area and how a person dresses himself because, see, some of the areas of the outward will expose the inward. Amen? And, and so many times people live in an area of trying to impress people or prove to people when we're pre-approved. See, when you have a relationship with the Lord, you don't need to prove nothing to nobody. When there's an area of people always trying to prove whether they're right or the wrong or whatever, that's not a relationship with God. Because everything for me and you should be the Lord knows. Does everybody get it? Everything should be the Lord knows. The Lord knows. So when you and I are falsely accused or judged of something, whatever, by a person, as long as you know that God knows what's right, you ain't got nothing to worry about it. You don't have to prove yourself. Amen. You're pre-approving. Oh, hallelujah. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. That's relationship. Not that the Lord doesn't tell you sometimes you need to rebuke someone, you know. Because he says, why? Get them in order. But you're not proving something to anyone. You're exposing wickedness. Verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living sacta, sanct, a sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. How are you going to present your body as a living sacrifice? He says, holy. 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 That means a sanctified. So for me and you, every day we should be presenting ourselves. Lord, I present to you my spirit, soul, and body, and flesh, will, desires, and possessions as a living sacrifice. Take them, you're yours. We present these things. It's our acceptable to God, which is your responsibility and my responsibility. He said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your thoughts or your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you are proving God's will by walking it out, by working it. Amen? So we're to present ourselves... A holy conduct sanctified. A life of sanctification to God. Keeping our thoughts heaven bound. Heaven bound. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Life of sanctification. Oh, happy days. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 1. Hallelujah. Let's speak it. But concerning, uh, finally then, brethren, is everybody there? 
we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should what? Abound more and more. Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Can you walk and please God without sanctification? No. For you, now, you know, you think about this. Well, then, sanctification is an area where we are separated into God. We're His, but we're staying clean. Now, spiritually clean. Amen? We're staying clean. We're not touching things that are unclean. We're not touching drugs. We're not touching alcohol. We're not touching pornography. We're not touching thoughts of corruption. We're not touching things that are unclean. There's no more fornication. There's no pornography. There's no things that are wrong in the eyes of God. That is an area where we are sanctified. We're not misusing our freedom. See, because even misusing the freedom is not sanctification. That nullifies it. Misusing our freedom is touching something that's unclean. Because something is promoting that. That we should walk and please God in how we ought to. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel. In other words, you should know how to say yes or no to whatever it is. You should have the discernment to know what's clean and unclean, what's holy and unholy, what's righteous, unrighteous, what's lawful and unlawful, what's pleasing and displeasing. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor to God. Not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage and defraud his brother in this matter. Why? Because it's touching something unclean. Frauding someone is lying. Amen? Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to what? Holiness. But to what? Holiness. Wow. It is the will of God to be sanctified if you want to carry out his plan of grace. Only those who will carry out his will are sanctified. Other than that, an individual that's not sanctified and still touching unclean things, knowingly or unknowingly, will not be able to carry out the will of God. Does everybody understand it? It is impossible to carry out the will of God without sanctification. Second Thessalonians 2. You know, there are things that um, you're not going to go to hell for doing. Amen? But there are things that are going to separate you from God for doing. Sanctification. Now, here's an area of it. And he's our fulfillment, right? So people that drink, smoke, those are unclean things. Chew tobacco, those are unclean things. Why? They're looking for a fulfillment, aren't they? They're looking for another feeling. When our feeling comes from the presence of God. That's where peace, joy, and righteousness is. So anything to that degree that tries to bring a false fulfillment in that area is unclean. So you may, a person may be a smoker. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. But it means they, you're judging by the fruit. That means they're not close to God. Because they're not sanctified. Does everybody get it? I'm not going to take, if somebody comes up with, to me with a bottle of wine and a cigar in their mouth and says, I have a word for you, I'm going to tell them I got a word for you. Come out. You know, sin does increase. The word says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It will increase. Nobody gets away with it. When there's sanctification, okay, you're going to have to grab hold of this for a second. When there's sanctification, there's not sin. There's a mistake. 
Does everybody hear that? When you're in the sanctification with the Lord, there's no sin. There's a mistake. So we repent because of mistakes. Not because it's sin. So everybody grab hold of that. It is totally different. See, but the enemy wants to approach you and go, man, you sinned. You need to give me 25 push-ups. Again, when there's that closeness with him, it's not sin. It's a mistake. Because there's such a close relationship. Why? Because you're sanctified unto him. You're hidden in a secret place. There is a love affair that's going on. Let's see, that's why discipline leads to relationship. And you maintain discipline, you will eventually have a love affair. But the, the process of a love affair is slowly breaking off of things from the world so that he can become your first love and maintain your first love. See, but the enemy always wants to bring the things from the world back into us where we drift from the first love and we begin to compromise the areas of the world. And the person finds himself back in the original state of trouble. It may start it off with a mistake, but it ended up sin. Amen? Hallelujah. Is everybody all right? Woohoo! <laughs> verse 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter two, verse, chapter 2. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for what? Salvation through what? Sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. All right, now we got to stop here for a second. Now, he just told us that salvation, the requirement of fulfilling salvation is sanctification. That blows the theology of once saved, always saved. Does everybody get it? Because a person that's not living a sanctified life, amen, or chooses, even though they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they're not living a sanctified life, salvation is not a guarantee. Or else we wouldn't have to repent, amen. So he says, your salvation is determined by your sanctification. Jesus paid the price for our salvation that we would cooperate with his grace his plan of sanctification and his plan. See, there's a plan for me and you in relationship with him. There is a plan for him that works through us. See, there's our destiny and then there's his works through us. So in everything, sanctification is essential. That's why we must have more discernment. That's why we pray for wisdom. That's why we stay away. That's why the word says depart from evil. Amen? Depart from evil. So without sanctification, there is no salvation. Does everybody get it? Praise God. Salvation comes by sanctification and a, and a holy lifestyle, avoiding sin of lust and corruption and rebellion towards the ways of Christ. Again, it blows away the theology of once saved, always saved. That is not a true theology of Christ. Remember, grace is God's plan. It's not, it's not a free will or an excuse to sin. Not at all. Who you serve when you die is where you go. That's why people are out there partying, thinking because they're Christians, it's okay. They're good. They die in that condition, they're going to wake up in the wrong place. They usually wake up in the wrong place anyways, but this. Romans 15. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit is our sanctifier. He's the one that's always trying to bring us to a place of sanctification. That's why it's so important to know his unction and his leading. 
And you know, that's where the familiar spirits and demonic spirits come in because they always want to mislead an individual. Well, listen, when you got to begin to justify, you better look at that. If you're going to begin to compromise, because see, justification comes first, then compromise. You're going to justify. Justification and compromise will disqualify sanctification. Because it's always trying to move you out, move you away. Justify this, justify that. But, 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 but. There is no doctrine of but. Amen? We're the head, not the tail. Verse 14. Romans 15, 14. Now, I myself am, is everybody there? 15, 14. Yeah, I'm there. Cool. Is anybody else there? Oh, that's good. Praise God. Now, I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to ad admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by who? The Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any other things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and in deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to Ilkrium I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it to my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who are not, have not heard, shall understand. For this reason I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whether I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. Now this is so powerful because in this, he's talking about sanctification by the Holy Spirit to declare the truth of Christ Jesus. That is a requirement. You know, again, there are many people out there preaching the gospel that are not sanctified unto God. And he says that they will come eventually to him and he'll say to them, I don't know you. And they'll say, but Lord, we preached, we healed, we delivered, we fed, we clothed. He said, but you practice lawlessness. Why? Because without sanctification, a person will practice lawlessness. Amen? Again, we are right now, we are being prepared for aggressive anointing to be released. So there's got to be sanctification of the Holy Spirit so that a holy conduct can be manifested. We are in such a great time and season right now. The world is under judgment. Why? Because we're under judgment. But the world's judgment will be different than our judgment, like we said. Go to Matthew 12. There's got to be a physical house cleaning and a spiritual house cleaning. Because accursed items will interfere with your sanctification. Matthew chapter 12. In verse 31. Now let's start at 30. Did you bring your Holy Ghost eraser? Matthew 12, verse 30. And you've got to remember something also, because this is a military operation, not a religious one. Amen? So we're being trained. 
God has to prepare us. Why? Because there's a war going on. We're, you and I were born in a war, and we can't lose sight of that. And every day is a battle. And the enemy's trying to reconnect us back to the world, and God is trying to sanctify us away from it. In verse 30, it says, Jesus said, He who is not with me is what? Against me. And he who does not gather with me, what? Scatter. So you're either a gatherer or a scatterer. Verse 31. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but every blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven men. Why? Because he's the sanctifier. He's called Holy Spirit and sanctification. Anyone that comes against sanctification, he will not forgive. Now, in this, it means in the full meaning of this so that people don't freak out. I mean, I grieve the Holy Spirit. That's not, that's different. That means you made a mistake. Amen? If you have that relationship. This is an area to where a person rejects the acceptance by the hand of God, by the Spirit of God. He rejects salvation. Or he turns from salvation. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier of our soul. He's the one that keeps us sanctified to keep us close to Christ. Amen? So when we reject that, that means we walk away from Christ. We've rejected and walked away from salvation. We walked away from... That means there is no blood covering or what we call forgiveness so that person will be under the wrath of God. Event, whether and that person dies in that condition, they will come before the Lord and the Lord will judge them. If the person doesn't die in that condition to buy and still left here on, on the earth, that person will go through the wrath of God eventually if it's during tribulation. Or they'll go through many opportunities where God will try to turn their hearts where they repent and turn back. But the final end result of it is that a person dies without accepting Christ Jesus. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Does everybody get it? But for me and you right now, see, people don't realize that the, uh, one of the operations of the Holy Spirit is to keep us sanctified. And by keeping us sanctified, all things are available. You will not have access to the things of God without sanctification. There will be limitations of access. Amen? Okay, so, hallelujah. Verse 32, are you ready for this now? Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Now, what's a tree represent? A person or a spirit. He says, bro to vipers, how can you be in evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you, for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. There was a gentleman that was died. He was brought, he spent time with the Lord. And when he came back, he gave testimony of how our words are affecting everything. Everything. He said they're destroying people. People are destroying themselves. You know, we just talked about gossip and all of that stuff. It's destroying people. Those words are going on people and sticking to them. And there are words on ourselves. The Bible says what you sow is what you reap. Amen. That's why we don't do AA. Because we're no longer drug addicts. You just curse yourself. But in this is an area where you and I must break labels and repent for any words that we have spoken that would bring harm to someone. Now, I speak words on purpose to bring harm 
to the demonic forces. Amen? But the word of love people, forgive them and bless them. Speaking forgiveness and blessing basically is harmful to them. Because the word says, God will judge them. Does everybody understand that? When someone is out of order, when someone is out there, you know, a heathen family member, and they say stupid stuff, they don't get it. Lord, I just forgive them and bless them. <laughs> yeah, get them, Dad. You know? I forgive them and bless them. Why? Because that allows God to go on them and convict them and sometimes hunt them until they turn around. But only God knows what needs to be done with them. But for me and you, things that you and I speak, we reap. And so many times people don't get it. They just throw the words out like it's okay. And the Lord was sharing with him, look at some of these words are going to prevent you from getting to me. You need to repent these words. All of these words that were negative. All of these words that were harmful. You know how many times did you ever tell yourself, I'll never be able to do this? And you weren't. Amen. Then he began to show him something very powerful. And he showed him a nuclear explosion. And the cloud went up. But the most effective part of the whole thing was not the cloud going up. It was a force afterwards that drove out everything. And he said to him, that's tongues. That force, what you just saw, wasn't the explosion. It was the force. He said, that's tongues. And when my people are praying in tongues, that force is going. And it's more effective than anything. And people don't realize that and they're not praying in the spirit enough. See, the enemy will do everything he can to prevent people from praying in tongues. That's the devil. That's not God. Man, when this man was giving his testimony and I show, he, I, I thought, I think, thank you, Lord. That's why Paul said, I wish you prayed more in tongues like I do. But when he saw that nuclear explosion and the force coming out and driving out and wiping out everything, he said, that's tongues. If my people will pray more in tongues because they're not praying their will, they're praying my will. And my will is more forceful and more penetrating than anyone's will. When you lack up in tongues, that's an influence of the enemy. When you refuse to go after that gift, that's the enemy. I've always known from the beginning that tongues was powerful. It causes things to move supernaturally. But if you're not sanctified, what good is tongues? Amen? Sanctification allows me and you in a place and position with heaven behind you. If God be with you, who can be against you? You know, no matter what rises up, no matter what's going on, it doesn't matter. Praying in tongues is vital. Go to Jude for one second here. Glory. The book of Jude. Hallelujah. In verse 14. Is everybody okay? Are you learning something today? It says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men or women, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Judgment on the things that were spoken. These are grumblers. Hello. 
complainers, hello, walking according to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by our apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause what? Divisions. Not having the spirit. Why? They've grieved the spirit. The spirit's moved away from them. Now familiar spirits have come. Now they're against tongues. They're against this. They're against that. They're against everything that promotes sanctification. But promotes self-righteousness. Verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up. How many of y'all want to be built up? Amen. Building yourself up on your most holy faith, sanctified faith. By what? Praying in the Holy Spirit or praying in what? Tongues. Keeping yourself in the love of God. Wow. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, make a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating, hating even the, the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to whom he was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God and our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, and majesty, dominion, power, both now and forever and ever and ever and ever. 1 Peter chapter 4. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Verse 12. Let's speak it. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Praise God. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you alone. <laughs> But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Oh, yes. That when he, his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed. But on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other people's matters. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for what? Judgment. To begin where? At the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Oh, yeah. And let's go to 2 Corinthians 6. Judgment in the house. tested on our sanctification and it will also promote sanctification. Today's message is to promote sanctification and preparation. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 6 in verse uh, I think it's 11. We've been out a few times. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's speak it together. Is everybody there? 
I'm in First Corinthians. That ain't going to work. Okay, I'm not there. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections or your aggressive emotions. <laughs> now, in return to some of I speak to you as children, you also be open. Do not be what? Unevenly yoked with, together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with the idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk among them, I'll be their God, and they'll be my people if they do something for me. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. That's sanctification. And don't touch what is unclean. And I will receive you. And I'll be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. In other words, sanctification is closeness. I'm going to close at Ephesians 5. Glory. Verse 1. Let's speak it. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. As an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness and, or covetousness let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. For this, <clears throat> neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor what? Neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor of course jesting, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetousness man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let none of you, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. How are you going to find out without sanctification? You won't. You'll assume it the rest of your life. There's too many assumptions in the body. Not enough knowings. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of what? Darkness. But rather what? Expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't be drunk with wine, and, and which is dispensation, but be what? Fill with the Holy Spirit. Speak it to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another, in other words, respecting one another in the fear and reverence to God. See, where there's no sanctification, there is no respect. Again, it, we are being tested now. In our sanctification. Because we're about to see. And I'm telling you now. Because we're about to see judgment. In, the ne in these next few days come. And maybe in this next full week. I don't know. But there's a, a turnover. Coming right away. Well we want to be positioned. And sanctified. So Lord we just take this opportunity. Right now and we repent. We ask for everything that we've done. In spoken word, thought or deed. That has offended you in any way whatsoever. Before we take communion today, Lord, we want to be sure that we are sanctified unto you. So please, have mercy upon us and let your grace abound. We forgive and we bless everyone 
that has offended us, used us, spoke against us, and doesn't live up to our expectations. We cast them off into your hands. We sever all emotional attachments with people, places, and things. And we present to you our spirit, soul, and body as a living sacrifice. Again, wash us with the blood of the Lamb. Heal us with the stripes of Jesus. And refresh us and reconnect us, protecting what has been spoken to us today. That the seed and your word would grow and partake of every part of our members and beings. That we may be grow more and more sanctified unto you. For your name, for your glory, and for your honor. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.